Uh, now it's time for my sermon. Uh, and uh, before I begin, I'd just like to say that uh, there are many flavors of Unitarian Universalists. Uh, some of us are pagan, some of us are nature mystics, uh, some of us are atheists and materialists and pantheists, and uh, some of us believe in a personal God. Uh, we're really kind of all over the place, but that's part of who we are. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, really uh, what or uh, how you want to be in relationship to the universe is uh, uh, something that uh, you have to decide for yourself. And here's a, this is a place where we help people, uh, help all of us, myself included, uh, uh, come to our own understandings. Uh, when I was about uh, 13 in a shop class, I fumbled with a handsaw and ruined a piece of wood that was supposed to be part of a toolbox I was building. I exclaimed, oh hell, Mr. Pitter, the shop teacher, who was a very nice man with persistent with halitosis, called me aside and very seriously and somewhat odiferously asked me, what would your mother think if she could have heard you just now? It turns out that what would your mother think is a pretty good question and can be applied to a lot of issues. Uh, we will do that later in this service. If I could be transported back to 1963 in that shop class and seeing the world as I now see it, I might have responded to Mr. Paler by saying something like, that depends on which of my mothers you are talking about. I have three mothers, everyone does. And by way of footnote, speaking of imagining my, myself back in middle school, I feel compelled to mention that in the 50s and 60s, our school symbol was a squirrel. Our sports team, some of which I played on, were known as the fighting squirrels. This made us very ferocious competitors, able to strike terror in the hearts of teams with lesser mascots like the Leonard North Dakota Panther, Panthers and the Hanganson Minnesota Pirates. Anyone who's ever been charged by an enraged squirrel knows the terror of which I speak. Back to task. Everyone has three mothers. The first mother is a mother that is part of our instinctual package. She is hardwired into you. It makes no difference what your gender is. This mother is a nurturer and fierce protector. Growing up on the farm, I often saw that mother in the animals we raised. My siblings and I were free range children. We were free to go pretty much any place in the farm except where the mother pigs were caring for their babies. Most cows would let you walk up and pet their newborn calves, but pick up a baby pig and you can be in trouble very quickly. I have not ever been charged by a squirrel, but I have on two occasions been charged by a mother hog protecting her young. In the first attack, I managed to scramble over a wooden fence to avoid injury. A 300 pound sow hit the fence board so hard with her snout that she snapped it in two. When I was five, I witnessed the instinctual protective mother in my own mother when she waded into the middle of a dog fight that threatened my brothers and me as we sat on the grass outside of the farmhouse kitchen door. I still shiver when I think of how violent my mother could be as she beat up the dogs with a frying pan she had just pulled off the stove. Our second mother is a mother programmed into you by your actual mother. Whereas the instinctual mother is hardwired, the program mother is an important part of our software. A lot of how we feel about life until the day of our passing is conditioned into us by how our mother felt about, about us, how our mother felt about us and herself and themselves. If you are perpetually of a sunny disposition and generally feel optimistic about life, you can probably thank your mom. If your disposition goes the other way, the same is probably the case. Before the pandemic, I was sitting idly in a park near our house. A young mom was pushing her, I would guess to be four-year-old son on the swing set. She was attempting to teach the youngster to pump his legs so he could propel himself. She was not having much luck. In frustration, she said, you are such a loser. You can never learn to do anything right. This is an example of unhelpful parental programming. It is a line of code programmed into the child's psyche that will surface again and again over his lifespan. It will, unless he learns to re repair himself, be with him until the day he dies. What a tremendous burden to bear. How much better if that young mom could have said something like, look how hard you are working. You have got quite a lot of, you have not quite got the hang of it yet, but I know that you soon will. You are so smart and strong. I think you can do just about anything you set your mind to. The third mom is your actual flesh and blood mother. My mom was born in 1929. 
the second oldest of nine children. Her life was work from sun up to past dark, caring for her siblings, cooking for the family, and there are several hired men working in the gardens, feeding the livestock, milking the cows, cleaning the barns, and driving tractors in the fields. She got her driver's license at the age of 11 so she could legally drive grain trucks in town and dump their loads at the grain elevator, something that she had been doing illegally for a year. All my mom knew was work. When she married my dad, she went to work making a home for our family, which involved a lot of work raising and butchering chickens, turkeys, and hogs, setting hundreds of mason jars aside each season full of homemade pickles, tomato juice, string beans, red beets, pumpkin squash, plum jelly, gooseberry, strawberry, raspberry, and buffalo berry jam, gallons and gallons of sweet corn kernels stripped from the cob, plus mountains of dried apples from her own trees, a five gallon ceramic crock full of homemade sauerkraut and bushels of potatoes in the basement bin. My mom did have one passion. She loved the garden. She loved flowers and raised many rows of gladiolas, poppies, poppies roses, irises, and asters. She had three large gardens and two small heated greenhouses in which she spent hours and hours starting and nurturing seedlings. She eventually became a master gardener and judged flower shows all over North Dakota and as far west as Washington state. My mom was a person of the earth. I often heard her say, a little dirt never hurt anyone. On occasion, I would hear her say of her dirt stained and dirty fingernails, it looks like I need to bake some bread to get these hands clean. Mom was not kidding. Kneading bread was a very effective way of cleaning her dirty fingernails and softening the skin on her calloused hands. I never have been able to make a loaf of bread as tasty as my mom's. Eventually, mom had to go into a nursing home. She had been taking care of others for so long, she didn't know any other way of being. So she petitioned the home administrator to let her spend an hour or so a day folding the facility's towels as they came out of the dryer. It was also her habit, three times a day, to round up those from her wing of the care facility that had advanced infirmities and lead them down the hall to the cafeteria for their meals. One of the last times I saw my mom alive, she was like a mother hen, leading her chicks clanking down the hall on her walker while being followed by four ulsters in wheelchairs in a caravan of the infirm. My mom still mothering till the end. My mom was a woman of the earth. I suspect that she knew something that many of us have forgotten, which is that the earth has a language that speaks a way of knowing that transcends the senses and is in direct communion with the human heart. So today I'm going to have an imaginary conversation with my late mother, asking her a question that cannot be answered by science, reason, or applied mathematics, but only by a greater communion. I imagine this conversation taking place and as my mom was working in her potting shed, separating seedlings. My mom was not one for idleness. The only time she sat down during her waking hours was when she was doing something like shelling peas, sewing, or doing needlework. So here goes, me. Mom, do you think we have a future as a species? Will we survive to further evolve? Or do you think that this is the end game and we will extinguish ourselves with war, political division, and altered climate? My mother, we will survive. There are seasons in life. This one seems particularly trying, but it will pass and another season will come with its joys and struggles. I don't think the earth is done with us yet. We will make it if we do not forget who we are. Me, who are we? My mom, we are the earth. We are soil, black dirt somehow become human. When we forget that we are dirt, we lose track of ourselves and the whole world suffers. Me, what do you mean when you say the whole world suffers? My mom, we do not live only unto ourselves. If I am unhappy, have a, lost a sense of meaning and a feeling of vitality, it more, than affect, it more than affects just me, it affects the whole community and the community in turn affects the world. The recent mass shootings perpetrated by young white men are a case in point. These unfortunates do not do, could not do the evil they do if they had a reason to be and felt the web of life vibrating through them. The web of life binds us to the earth, the cosmos, and each other. Me, tell me about the web of life, mom. My mom, 
The web of life is a connection between all things. It binds together the ant in my garden with faraway galaxies. <clears throat> it binds together a single hydrogen atom on the surface of the sun with a great blue whale swimming in the depths of the Atlantic. It binds together the light and the darkness. It binds together joy and sorrow. It binds together hope and despair. It binds the living and the dead. It binds together the end and the beginning. It binds us to each other and to the earth, earth, me. So mom, you think it is important to believe in the web of life? My mother, I don't give two hoots about what you believe. It is what you know in your heart that makes a difference. It is being able to receive from the web compassion, strength, and courage. It is about learning to gather up the manna of creativity and vitality that comes to us through the web. Me, how can I receive from the web? How can I know? My mom. We are back at the beginning of this conversation. We receive from the web when we remember that we are transformed dirt, dirt that is bound by the web of life to the stars and to transcending reaches where there are places and things that have not yet been imagined. Some good ways of remembering that you are transformed dirt is baking a loaf of bread, planting a row of carrots, pruning an apple tree, writing a poem, sitting up all night with a sick child, grieving the death of a loved one, sending some money to feed the poor, working in a soup kitchen, going meatless for a day, a week, or a lifetime, pick, learning to play an instrument, dancing a dance you invented when no one is looking, or even when they are, hugging your kid, hugging your dog, changing a diaper, the list goes on. You get the idea. We know the web by getting up to our elbows in life. It doesn't hurt to get a little dirt underneath your fingernails a little baby spit on your shoulder, our little commoner stuck to your boots. Thanks, Mom. I think I get the idea. It has been great having this imaginary conversation with you. <laughs>